I have actually uh, put a timer on myself. <laughs> Though apparently there is going to be a cutthroat gesture made at me uh, soon. Now, whether I uh, actually work with my uh, slides is uh, moot. Um, I tend to ignore them and go off script. Uh, thank you very much, though, to uh, the board for inviting me. Um, I was here two years ago and absolutely loved it. So I've come back again. Um, unfortunately, I fly back out tomorrow, so I'm not going to see much of Texas. But if you keep doing this, I'll keep coming back. <laughs> now, you have to bear with me because I've got a slightly odd sense of humour for those of you who, who uh, have come across me before. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't cross the pond very well. Uh, sometimes my accent doesn't work terribly well either. I've had quite a few people saying, sorry? <laughs> so I hope I'm clear. Um, if not, then just wave at me and I'll translate. Uh, lost in translation maybe works this way as well. Um, but my first couple of slides are indulgent, uh, partly because I, I enjoy coming over to the States quite often um, and have met up with a number of uh, uh, American colleagues. I should at this point just do a bit of a shout out to Norma and Jay. I can see Jay there, but I can't see Norma. Hey, Norma. We met, oddly enough, isn't it a small world, in Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK last month. It was grey and wet there too. Uh, so I feel very at home at the moment. I think it's sun coming out now. But whenever I say I'm from the University of Birmingham, the first thing that happens is, whoop, I click on, that. <laughs> No. Uh, I'm actually from the original version of, of Birmingham. <laughs> so apologies to those of you who are maybe from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, but uh, the, the reason I'm going to come up with the next slide is I often hear then Birmingham, that manufacturing town in the UK. Well, I'm not actually from Birmingham, um, but I've lived there now for going on 12 years. And so I think many of us feel very uh, keenly about our adopted cities. And I feel very keenly about Birmingham. So there you have a, a little picture of my campus. Um, it's a rather beautiful campus. If you come to the UK, please come and visit us. We have the world's tallest freestanding clock tower, which you can see rather prominently sticking up in the middle. Uh, it's called Old Joe, after the founder of the university, uh, Joseph Chamberlain, father of Neville Chamberlain, who rather infamously waved a piece of paper in uh, 1938, to little effect. Uh, so cracking on. This is my hymn of praise to Birmingham, and I promise I'll get down to business after this. But this is the Birmingham, the manufacturing town. Where is Birmingham? Uh, okay, it's in the UK, but is it near Manchester? Is it near London? So, what's Birmingham done for the world, apart from the Industrial Revolution? <laughs> it's actually where it started. So that's why we're called the manufacturing town, is because the Industrial Revolution started in Birmingham. And what did we actually give the world? Some of these are taken with a pinch of salt. You may spot one rather odd one in the list. Oxygen. <laughs> Didn't quite give the world oxygen. I think if we put our mind to it, we probably could have. Uh, this is actually the discovery that oxygen existed. Um, that happened in Birmingham. But things like the steam engine, James Watt, uh, Birmingham, uh, all of those names. So microwave, photocopier, radar, uh, Synthetic vitamin C, which I think many of us take with uh, some delight. Lawn tennis. Yes, we gave the world lawn tennis from Edgbaston, which is where my university is. Who knew? Slightly dodgy things. Birmingham is also the uh, world uh, centre for weapons. Uh, we provided the brown bess, which came over here uh, to not good effect. So you promptly sent it back again with, with the armies. Uh, and then we did some rather fun things, like the minicar. So the minicar is uh, designed and built in Birmingham. Cluedo, the board game, who knew? <laughs> the whistle. Pretty much every sports whistle uh, comes from the Acme Whistle Company in Birmingham, uh, including the largest whistle in the world called the Thunderer, which was used to limited effect on the Titanic. Uh, <laughs> So we've got a number of sort of slight fails uh, in here. And then perhaps most um, beloved of all, The Hobbit. J.R.R. Tolkien uh, uh, was from Birmingham, in fact, lived in the area that I live in, Moseley. And the local area is called The Bog, which is the origination for Middle Earth. So not only are we in the Midlands, we actually own Middle Earth too. <laughs> and because the clock tower was dominant at the time that J.R.R. Tolkien was uh, a boy and wandering around the area, um, 
It's considered that the clock tower, when it's lit up at night, was the inspiration for the Eye of Sauron. <laughs> you can sort of see it, can't you? Right, let's move on to business. So you can see I love my city. So come and visit us if you're over in the UK, because most of you go to London and then Edinburgh. There's something in the middle. <laughs> so my last sort of frivolous slide, because again, Birmingham causes some interesting things, but nothing compared to my name. So most people introduce me with some trepidation, thinking, how am I going to say that first name? Well, that's because I'm British mostly, but mostly Welsh. So that's my flag. If you ever wondered what that flag was, it's the flag of Wales. It's Raig uh, Koch, the uh, red dragon. So uh, if you want to uh, chat to me and you're worried about my first name, the U is an I in Welsh, so it's just a Lyned. Easy. Or you can call me Jones, which other people do. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about is, uh, for those of you who are in Austin, you'll have heard bits of this, but hopefully it's a moving on from that point. So things have progressed. And I'm always concerned talking to an audience outside of the UK that obviously I'm talking about a UK context. A lot of it does not translate. You're very fortunate it does not translate. Um, it's difficult enough living with it and working with it in the UK. But I think the reason that I'm invited to talk is there is a lot of similarity. And maybe we've had a chance to practice in this area for longer because of things that I'm going to uh, flag up in a moment. Um, the slide that I'm showing worked quite well last year, and it is about the national context. So you may remember it if you were here last year, which is I'm talking about a nation, a nation which is uh, driven by one government. Uh, well, we've actually got devolved governments now, which adds to the confusion, but it's driven by one government. So we are all working to one agenda, which is very different here because you're a state that swallows my entire country. Um, and if I just put Wales in there, we'd tuck away and sort of lurk somewhere with the little town of Wales, which actually here is in Texas. This works actually better in uh, Australia when I show the, the, this map because the whole of Europe and Britain disappears into Australia. So you are a state, and I'm slowly learning that actually you're driven by state legislation as well as federal. Um, I'm talking about a national agenda. So you have to, in a sense, make that switch. It won't always work here. In fact, you probably don't want it to, to, to work here. So, what are we driven by? Well, we're driven by acronyms. We are, we are sort of acronym soup, alphabet soup over in the, in the UK. Everything is an acronym. So, value for money, I think you'll all know. QA, quality assurance, a huge, huge issue in the UK, driving higher education and having a lovely conversation with colleagues from community colleges, further education in the UK, also driving that sector and our schools, your high schools. Um, Delhi, the destination of leavers from higher education. I know that NACE have been introducing um, a, a similar survey on a sort of comprehensive level, but I know many university career services have been running surveys of where their graduates go to for many years as well. But in the UK, we've been running uh, the graduate survey since 1994. It's a nationally required survey. Uh, it's done at six months post-graduation, and we have to have an 80% response rate. Um, nothing lower is accepted, otherwise we're not published. And that then gets turned into league tables, which drive us um, with a great big stick over our heads. And then another acronym came to join us, TEF, the Teaching Excellence Framework, which uh, you'll see from the picture on the uh, bottom right, uh, has actually ranked us as universities. Um, so the Com you may not know this, but the Commonwealth Games are going on in Australia at the moment, so I'm trying to watch that. I can't watch it on the BBC because the BBC won't allow me to watch it in America, which is annoying. Um, but you get used to people standing and getting gold medals and then silver medals and then bronzes. That's exactly how they've ranked universities now in the UK. So you're either ranked gold, silver or bronze according to an incredibly detailed quality assessment. There is no fourth place. Uh, fourth place means you're shut. Uh, in effect, you cannot be lower than bronze. Uh, an interesting approach to take when we're trying to recruit students from around the world to have an institution desperately trying to market itself with its bronze standing. So it's caused an awful lot of um, upset. But it is symptomatic of what drives us. And hopefully the rest of what I talk about falls into a little bit more context because of this national agenda. And I'm not suggesting you would ever want to follow this, though I think a number of countries, interestingly enough, are. Probably uh, Commonwealth, particularly uh, uh, Commonwealth countries associated with the UK. 
So we know that Australia is sadly following in our footsteps in terms of ranking and quality assurance, but so is Canada. Um, I hope it doesn't seep south across the border um, and uh, impact on you, but it brings dividends, um, and that's uh, something which I'll come on to. So employability skills, the whole agenda in the UK is driven in this context. Leo, oh, this is the absolute cracker, uh, longitudinal educational outcomes. This is the government actually using its access to graduate salaries through Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, I think your IRS, well, basically, our salaries are known to the government, if we pay <laughs> salaries, of course. I mean, if we're in a certain economy, that might not happen. But most of us in the UK, our salaries are known to the government through the uh, Revenue and Customs. So they've, uh, the government have cunningly gone into that and actually extracted graduate salaries, matched it against the graduates, and then presented, ta-da, uh, lists of what our graduates get, uh, get paid. One year, three years, five years, and in future, ten years. It's an interesting exercise. I wouldn't argue against that. It's actually really interesting to be able to, to track the tra trajectories, questionable though they are, of students who come from widening participation backgrounds or students with disability, where you often wonder, how disadvantaged do they remain in the workforce? Is this an ongoing disadvantage? Uh, the problem is it's still very new. Uh, they don't, um, at the moment, they're not actually adjusting it by region. So um, I get emails from my vice chancellor, your principals, saying, Leonard, he knows how to say my name. It's taken a few years, but uh, why are our doctors paid less than those at UCL or King's? And it's like, um, sir, because he is a sir. Well, Sir David, it's because they work in Birmingham. And Birmingham pays less because we're not in London. I don't say it quite like that because that's a bit snarky, but <laughs> it's a very true point. If we're going to be ranked then you have that in Texas, you have that in the States, you'll get paid more in certain cities. I would imagine you get paid a heck of a lot more if you're working in the digital industries in San Francisco compared to perhaps a digital job somewhere in Texas. Same for me with Birmingham. So we've got a long way to go before those sorts of um, uh, data are actually valid and useful, but they are indicators. So what else is happening with the uh, landscape? This is that sort of awkward age, I'll admit to, when very focals would come in very helpful. So I'm not trying to be studious. I just can't read through my glasses when the screen is close up to me. So we have uh, a higher education system uh, now uh, driven by fees. Not unusual to you. you you'll have lived through that system. Um, it's not uncommon to pay to go to university. But until fairly recently in the UK, we were actually paid to go to university as opposed to paying uh, to go yourself. So I, many decades ago, used to queue up under the letter J for Jones to get my little check. My fees were paid by the government to my university. I graduated with no debt. Interestingly enough, I also graduated with little in the way of skills because there wasn't really a driver for me to go do anything. So summer holidays were holidays literally for me, uh, or I went and dug. So yes, I am an archaeologist. Um, early medieval in the UK is Anglo-Saxon um, and Vikings. So little translatable value, really. <laughs> Could perhaps have gone to Norway to try and get a job there. But um, So we are now living the uh, life of fees which is having an impact, has had an impact. We're capping probably at 9,250. I think the government, particularly in the last election, where um, virtually all of the university cities and the student populations voted against the current Conservative government on the back of the fact that they were graduating with such significant debt. Now, the current government have heard that and in an attempt, I think, to ensure that they get re-elected in the near future, uh, they're talking about capping the fees or even reducing them. So it's highly unlikely those fees will go up. But they are required of every student at every university. And it doesn't differentiate between whether it's Bournemouth University or whether it's Birmingham or whether it's Cambridge. You pay the same amount. So I suppose there's an unfair fairness in all of that. League tables then use this data. Interestingly enough, the league tables that dominate the UK are not government-driven. They're driven by newspapers. So the Times newspaper, which many of you will be aware of, was one of the first to take the data 
turn it with their own methodology into national rankings and publish. Because people would then go and buy the paper physically and, and online subscriptions. And then the Guardian newspaper, which is a slightly more liberal version of the Times, very well known in the UK, it decided to do the same thing. So we have a raft of major newspapers actually creating league tables and rankings which are published every year, and we are all absolutely obsessed with them. Because it's a little bit like Emperor's New Clothes. You know, we can't argue against it. It's almost become its own truth. But again, for employability, I'll keep saying this until you get to the slides, it has a rather warped positive benefit. It's driven things which, from a career service point of view, are remarkably positive. Though I wouldn't have chosen to have been driven in those particular ways. I don't think any of us would have. Employability, though, from a university's point of view, is now a major part of his success outcomes. So we're looking at, what, 25% of a subject's um, quality assurance is based on employability. So the work that career services do and our academics and employers, the work that we do actually makes up 25% of the apparent success of that subject, as deemed by the government. That's a huge driver. Um, at an institution level, we make up 15% of the university's success measures. So these are the metrics set by the government to say to a university that receives public money, you are successful, you can keep getting your money. Um, key information sets have been produced. Again, if you want to look at these, I've, I've got slides at the end with links. If you're in need of something to put you to sleep, perhaps, I don't know. But you can go and look at our wonderful key information sets. But this is where the public information is probably at its highest and deepest level so that students thinking of going to university can compare courses. So you can say, well, what happens if I do history at Birmingham compared with history at Edinburgh, compared with history at Cardiff or history at London? Well, you can see in one place um, all of the different metrics, including graduate destinations into jobs, uh, etc. And that's where you'll see skills information as well. But we have a lot of skills information out there. Um, and I'll sort of rattle on here. But this, the, the, the last point I think I also heard earlier is that when students are asked now, why do you go to university? I have to admit, despite benefiting from all this, my heart sinks a little bit that the second most important reason is getting a good job. It's real, I know that, and I'm a different generation. But I'm also the person, and many career services have this sort of, sort of tension in the UK, which is actually... My belief is you go to university to grow, to become the individual you'll become as an adult, to make your lifelong friends, and more than anything, to study the subject that you love, whether it be Vikings or not. <laughs> and interestingly enough, I would never in a million years change that degree if I could go back, even though there weren't jobs in it, because I loved the subject, and I would go and dig happily any time. So that's what people heard... Um, last time I was here in 2016 in Austin. So what's happened since? Well, we've just got more intense, if that was possible. So this is where TEF came in. TEF has published its first results. I'm delighted to say that Birmingham achieved a gold. I don't think that we could have aff afforded not to because actually it has financial hits. Some other universities should be nameless, but they're not going to be, so the University of Nottingham. Uh, on the day that the uh, rankings were awarded, their website turned into a golden ticker tape with all sorts of little bits of gold dripping down their website with the sign, We are gold! Which I thought was a bit tacky myself. <laughs> we're above that. We had a very discreet little Tef gold logo on the bottom left part of our site. But these are financially massively important um, because if you tell students that universities are ranked gold, silver, and bronze. Guess where students want to go? They want to go to gold. Bronze. Oh, it's a little bit cheap, isn't it? Exactly the same degrees, but this ranking said, actually. Yeah. So we are in danger of creating a sort of almost like a two-tier where gold and silver, and then you've got the bronzes. So that's not something I would suggest, but again, it's having benefits for the employability agenda in a rather strange way. Um, and... Um, I think I was mentioned before, the, the impact of employability is moving to 50% of a ranking. So if you get gold, 
it's because 50% of what you submitted related directly to your employability, both your provision and your outcomes. That's a huge thing. For those of you from career services here who struggle with resources, you can imagine what that does. Huge, great big stick over your head, but then a wadge of money in the other hand. Uh, make it better. So, we are um, going to move on from the six month. I mean, I, this is just information, really, rather than skill stuff. We're moving on from the six month survey from this summer's graduates. We're moving to 15 months post graduation, which I think is a fairer reflection of a graduate's progress. Because, absolutely sure, if this had happened, in fact, I graduated long before um, uh, that these surveys were introduced in 94, which gives you some indication of how old I am. Um, but if they'd captured me at six months, I was working as a chambermaid in a London hotel. I can make a bed really well, though. Uh, so I did have some transferable skills out of that. And it certainly brought me out of myself because I had to knock on doors and walk in while, and making rooms while people were in their beds, which, you know, for a rather shy and retiring Welsh girl at 21. So a bit of an eye-opener. Uh, uh, right here, what else have I got there? Right, so, surprisingly positive outcomes I put down here. This is where you have to sometimes question if you're not sitting in the employability arena, you know, how positive some of these things are, but this is an employability... Well, I'm using the term employability, I perhaps should have said... I can flip-flop between employability, uh, transferable skills, backwards and forwards. I'm broadly talking about what you refer to as transferable skills. They are the skills, and let's not have a conversation about what skills are, what attributes are, and what competences are, because I will never leave the stage uh, if we start that. It is so caught up. Um, so we do have a bit of a mix of what people have referred to as soft skills, hard skills, and attributes. So you'll see one coming up where employers say they want humility. Well, okay, let's run a course on being humble. Or let's be very Dickensian and be humble. Um, very, very humble. Uh, and if it was, it would be false. Because, you know, we want our students to be buoyant and confident, not going around being very... Uh, it's bad enough in the UK that we tend not to stand up and shout. We tend to retire and sit back. We, we don't need to be encouraging that anymore. So what does it manage to do, though, in having a focus on employability and skills? Well, pretty much every university in the UK has something which may not exist here. And I am absolutely not saying it doesn't exist at all. I know it exists in certain institutions. But again, without these drivers, it's perhaps less likely. So every institution now, I can't think of one that doesn't, has an institution-wide employability strategy. This is not the career services strategy. This is the institution's employability strategy. And it impacts the entire institution from top to down, from side to side. That is massively different. Because when I arrived in 2007 at Birmingham, that didn't exist. This has all happened really intensively in the last six, seven years. But it does, again, focus attention. Because you cannot have an institution strategy that is not based on a collaborative approach, or you shouldn't have one. And if you do, that isn't based on a collaborative approach, it won't work. It'll, it'll just become a paper exercise very quickly. Um, skills requirements, now built into program approval. Now, that was a heady day when I got an email. Well, I sort of got the email at my university because I threw my toys out of the pram at an email I received that... I get these regular emails saying a new degree has been approved and will be available for admission in the coming September. And I looked at the title of the degree, the subject area, and had a little hissy fit. I'm not going to say what it was because it's not fair, but I knew that if the university was holding me to graduate destinations as my KPT, this degree was almost single-handedly going to drag us down because it did not produce graduate-level jobs. Uh, I went say what the degree is, but you might be able to guess. But you have programmes in the, in the US, which we often watch in the UK, called things like NCIS. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got these forensic science teams. Is that right? And they have staff and incredible kit. And they run around with badges doing things, which I'm not sure that forensic scientists are supposed to do. They seem to be more police officers, but... 
So you have an entire industry, which may or may not be real, but you know, we look at it from over the pond going, wow. Uh, guess what? We don't have that. <laughs> we have probably about 20 or 30 individuals who work across our police forces. So each county has its own police force, like a, a state would. Of course, we're tiny, so we don't need that many. Unfortunately, we don't have many serial killers. These programs scare me, because quite frankly, I clearly cannot walk amongst your cities. I, I can't go into a wood. I shouldn't go into a bank, because something horrific is going to happen to me, <laughs> which is obviously arrogant nonsense. Um, but in the UK, we're, we're fortunately still quite polite. Uh, London's having a bit of a problem at the moment, but we're still quite polite, and we tend not to murder each other that much. So there's not really an industry. Uh, so this degree, this particular degree for me, was just a bit of a nightmare. So I sent an email which was very British, which is very, goodness me, if you're on this degree, don't you realise this will happen? It was very politely couched, even politer than that. But I think they sort of took on board that they'd created a tension between two KPTs, which is positive graduate destinations and recruitment of students. Recruitment of students always has to win because it equals money and it equals the mission of the university. But there's still me trying to get all of these students' jobs, 80% of them positive jobs within six months after graduation. And I think it probably was the sort of straw and camel's back because the next thing I see happening is that actually every new degree programme and every amended degree programme now comes via my desk. And I have the power to say no. I'm not sure if they'd actually listen because I've not said no yet. But I am able to say, if the university pursues this, this will be the impact, positively or negatively. But it's also built into the fact that if it is going to achieve an employability outcome, it has to demonstrate that at the point of inception. And I think that's what I heard Ginger refer to, that you have now. But I'm not entirely sure that the career services have a voice in that process. It may just be that it's written. So the skills are now written in to program approval and program review. Um, and the career service has a voice in whether those are the right skills and whether the partnerships identified within the program documentation are accurate, i.e. links with employers, links with industry. For that, that's absolutely a huge shift in the UK and certainly in my institution, which is quite telling about how important employability has become to the debate in the UK. And we also have a situation now where because we've been required to identify the transferable or employability skills in our degree programmes, we've become quite sophisticated, I think, in actually presenting them to prospective students as well as current students. In some cases, the current students learn, in some cases, about the skills they're developing from the prospective students' information. Um, so we've not entirely joined the, the dots on that one. To give you an example, and I think... Uh, you may or may not be able to see it, but I think the slides are being shared. So this is just my, my rather sad attempt at a screenshot from a page from the University of Birmingham, and it's one of its history degrees. So it's an absolutely classic standard history degree, a three-year programme. But this is the sort of information that now is required to be put up for prospective students and is built into all of the module uh, level information, so module and programme level information. One of the problems I have with this is, whilst I think this is a huge step forward and very, very helpful, is that, um, as we'll see in, in a moment, skills change. So, you know, this exercise is the first step. It's something that has to be reviewed and renewed on an annual basis because I don't seem to be able to turn around without a new skill popping up um, or a, a new variant of a, of a skill. So you'll see the obvious thing of, of communication skills. I'm not sure a skill is a deep understanding of the past. I think that's slightly questionable. That's uh, more a learning outcome, perhaps. But research, analyze, and interpret complex information is a nod to the whole issue of statistics and the digital debate that is now so strong in our universities and in our workforces. Leadership and teamwork, et cetera. Um, the ability to form concise and articulate arguments. It's, I think it's one of the reasons why you'll find historians in so many different roles is because typically the question in a history degree, I mean, how many historians are there in the room? There's quite a few of us in higher ed I tend to find, is that the question in history is not normally what happened in 1066, it's why did it happen? What were the implications? What was the impact of it? It makes you think critically 
You're not just regurgitating facts. This is why so many historians in the UK translate into law. And before I forget it, I should actually say that we have also another driver in the UK, which seems to be pretty unique at a global level. I don't find it in Europe, I don't find it here, I don't find it in Canada, I don't find it in Australia, which is that 80% of graduate jobs advertised in the UK are open to a degree of any discipline. Now, that is an amazingly powerful thing for a graduate, but it also produces this, <laughs> as the graduate almost effectively screws themselves into the ground, thinking, well, what can I do then if I can do everything? What can I do? It was so much easier when I did an accountancy degree and I was going to become an accountant. I may have hated the job, but at least I knew that was the job. <laughs> and now we're saying to accountants, well, you can be a doctor if you want to, but you'll have to do another degree. But barring that, and veterinary science and maybe it's engineering disciplines and architecture where you've got a very specific professional requirement. You can do anything. So you're actually saying to students, you are empowered, and at the same time, you're confusing the heck out of them because they go, well, how do I decide? So, you know, we've got swings and roundabouts on that one. But it does mean that, again, we've had a debate in the UK driven by industry, by commerce, by business, who have worked alongside university career services and academic communities for decades. I find it, I suppose, unusual to think that there needs to be a debate with industry when I can't, I can't move at my university for falling over industrial lays on boards and employer advisory boards, um, which are wonderful and they bring employer voices in, but they give them a place to have a debate. And it's an equal debate. It is not employers saying, you as a university must produce students with this skill set. This is what we want you to do. They would like to be able to say that, but they also are aware that it's a partnership. So they contribute to that debate, and that's very, very important, but they don't drive it. Um, and I think that balance is really important, particularly, particularly in certain subject areas, because you can imagine something like English literature, you know, the idea that that degree would be driven by industry. It isn't, but interestingly enough, English literature produces an awful lot of freelancers, people who go into freelance editorial work and similar, or they get contracts working with um, newspapers, temporary contracts. Many of them are what we might call self-employed. And their skill set is actually quite industry-related. But it's, forgive me if there are English literature professors in the room, it's sometimes harder to get that argument across, particularly if you're talking about poetry. It's like... So, maths, here's just another example. So you have the history lot dissecting, and they like to present theirs with bullet points. Um, the maths lot, mathematics, uh, are slightly more verbose, but the same thing is happening here, where they're actually saying to prospective students, this is what you will get from this degree. You will get the subject knowledge, but you also get this. And that's a huge step forward. So we've had this for about two to three years. Well, certainly I think it kicked in before I came in 2016. And pretty much most universities, you will see this on their websites. If, you, if you've got a programme and you're thinking, well, what would the skills be? Well, just have a little scout around. If you look at some of the Australian universities, they're also doing it. So if you look at the University of Wollongong or uh, Curtin, you'll see a similar approach being taken. I always like not to duplicate. I like to borrow is the term I use, borrow good ideas from places. So what are the other positive destinations, uh, outcomes from this? Well, for career services, it's been a game changer, absolutely phenomenal game changer. Um, ever since this uh, fee issue came in in 2012, the sad thing is that it brought with it the marketization and customization of higher education debate which is, if I do this degree and I pay you this amount of money, what are you going to give me? Now, rarely do you ever hear a student say that. Students are still in love with their subjects. They're still in love with coming to university and growing and making friends and leaving home. That's usually the big driver. But at our open days, which you will have, there is always somebody there asking that question, and it's the parents. Um, as a parent of a second-year historian, Lord help me, um, I am trying. I'm trying to get him focused, but it's like, you know, forget it. The mum, you can't say anything sensible. But the parents are saying, what will happen? Because I'm the debt holder, really. You know, we have a, a strong family dynamic. You know, I don't see my son daughter as being cut adrift. You know, if they graduate with debt and struggle with it, I'm going to be there uh, helping out. So I'm going to ask the questions. 
What sort of job will you get? What are they going to develop? What sort of work experience are they going to have? Those are the people asking the question. And I think American universities do a much better job with parents than UK universities. I think we're only just discovering them as a really important cohort to work with. Um, why am I still talking about that one? Oh, I'm going to stop myself for a moment because I jumped ahead. Because I've got the two slides going on here, you see, so I, 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 I jumped. Degree apprenticeships, though, have been introduced. Now, this is a, something which may exist here. I, I don't know your system well enough, but this is actually the combined development between an employer and a university of a degree programme that is shared between them. So, for example, PricewaterhouseCoopers have recently developed a computer science degree for financial services that Birmingham runs, but they're employed by PwC. So for students, it's an absolute win-win because they're salaried. They don't have debt and they have a guaranteed job at the end, but it's still a degree. So they spend time on campus being students, but they're also actually in a workplace. Now that type of sandwich course split has been around for a long time, but this particular package of degree apprenticeships is very new for us. So what was I going to show you? Well, for career services, because we are centrally in the debate of employability, and I'm, I'm not sure how that plays out here, whether career services feel they are at the centre of that debate or whether they contribute to it. We tend to have been written into this debate. We're like the owners of the employability flame. Um, grudgingly so, I think, in the earlier days where we were held to account with no resource. But as the pincer movement of rankings and and demands by government became ever more intense and it became ever more important to produce uh, positive destinations and to do the employability thing well, um, then resource followed. And so uh, Peter was very kind to refer to my multi-million pounds. Do you know, it's awkward when you write that stuff for yourself and then it's read back to you and you go, oh, that was a bit, a bit pushy, wasn't it? But uh, there you go. Uh, so university career services are large. So this is my service. Uh, you probably can't see it, except all those boxes equal multiple people. So if you can't see it, I have 67 staff. I'm a central career service. We don't have career services in different faculties. If we have that model, it's because we have attached a group of our central staff to that faculty. Uh, the only time there is a separate career service in a university in the UK is when our beloved colleagues in business schools, who are clearly very, very wealthy, produce their own service. Um, and that's reasonably common. And what we do then is we work very closely in partnership with them. But they're the only faculty, I guess, who have the wealth in the UK system to be able to run their own services. And they do so for very good reason, because they, they have the MBA cohort, particularly international MBAs. But I'm not the largest service in the UK. I'm actually now middling. There are services now approaching 100 staff who are university career service staff. Isn't that it's like a little dream, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I'll just live with the career service colleagues. Just uh, For those of us who are managers, you do realise what that produces, though, doesn't it? As you spend all of your time with staff management issues. Wonderful, creative, talented, innovative, idea-driven people. Bless them. Uh, but we do, because we have this resource, we do a wide range of things, possibly wider than other services I've seen around the world. So we will go from business startup, so I have a team that does business startup, through classic careers counselling, through to online development, through to services for international students specifically, and then a specific service for our postgraduate students, particularly our PhDs. And then that rather forgotten cohort, our postgraduate taught, which is the MAMSC cohort, who can unfortunately be seen as cash cows, I think, simply uh, by their sheer number. But it, that staff structure only exists because employability has the um, profile that it does in the UK, and it, that profile only exists because of the ranking situation in the UK. So... You sort of want the resource, but you don't maybe want the sticks that are over your head as a result of it. But it does let us do amazing things. 
little Howard Carter moment there. You know, I can look through a little crack and say, I see wonderful things. Um, and we're always doing more and more and more. So that was the UK, and I realised that a lot of that context does not work here. I suppose I'm tempted to say, though, that if you are on, on this journey and employability or transferable skills are becoming a significant issue because of economic drivers in your institution, it may be that these things will follow because that's typically what's happened in the UK. So the sort of geopolitical drivers, they're usually the same depending, regardless of country. So it brings a huge amount of challenge but it also brings phenomenal opportunities. I'm probably jumping ahead of myself, but the relationship, for example, my career service has and UK career services have with our two key partners in this endeavour, and there are many other stakeholders, employers and the academy, are closer now than they've ever been because we have to play the game together. Where it falls apart is when each of those three, or particularly the academy and the career service, try and do things separately. Because we duplicate, and that's when the employers go, this is ridiculous. Dr. So-and-so phoned me up today. You're phoning me up now. I heard from three people last week. They don't like it. They want one point of contact. It's not always possible to give it to them. And there's always a place for individual contacts to be maintained. But it almost forced us to work together. It drove us together. And we actually found that we're the same. We have exactly the same ambition for our students. That the, the ac academics I was working with care passionately about the well-being and the outcome of their students, as do we. And I think once we'd started stopping seeing each other as like competitors, or that we were inferior, because I, I have an academic as a partner, and I'm often referred to as an administrator, if I get in trouble. You're an administrator, I'm an academic. And I go, yeah, OK. <laughs> but... There is an equal partnership. Uh, maybe not in our academics' minds, but in my mind, I have an equal partnership. But if, if the experience of the UK isn't a sufficient enough driver, there are other drivers out there. And I know I'm talking to the converted, so I do not mean to patronise. But there is a movement out there. And uh, it's part of the reason why I put the Birmingham thing up, because if we started the Industrial Revolution, then we're certainly having to play our part in the fourth version of that, so we're in this world of the fourth industrial revolution and you've got um, uh, Schwab's uh, uh, statement there about what it is. So if you ever wondered what the fourth industrial revolution is, it's actually the natural progression from the first through the second, the third to the fourth. And we hear about disruptive technologies, we hear about disruptive developments. This is the disruptive one. This is the one where it, all the chickens come home to roost, I think. And this is where the skills debate absolutely becomes uh, preeminent. We had some really interesting conversations. At least I thought they were very interesting. I'm sure, uh, hopefully others did. When we started talking about this transferability of skill between subject areas, where arts graduates are having to learn, and we heard it again uh, earlier, where arts graduates have to learn statistics. They have to become digitally competent. Um, Again, I can only talk from a career service point of view, but many career services now have a data analyst on staff. We're driven by data. Uh, I mean, in the UK, we've introduced something which doesn't necessarily belong to the skills debate, but it's called career registration. I, those colleagues who were in Newcastle will have heard about it. This is actually a revolution for career services where no matter how many staff I've got, I've got 36,000 students, which is smaller than many of you, I know, but I... I can't serve 36,000 students, even with 67 staff. So I have this tension that actually I present my services to the community, the student community, and those who use me probably don't need me as much as those who don't use me, who hide or ignore me or leave things to the last minute. They're the ones who need the help, but who are they? It's not a simple gap analysis that those who use me don't need me, therefore those who didn't use me are the real ones. No, it's far more subtle than that. Many who don't use me don't need me, actually. They're perfectly uh, capable of getting work, and they probably got it. But I want to find maybe that four or 500 uh, cohort who really need me, 
They have no idea where they're going. They have no work experience to speak of. They're not getting any. And they have no clue about their future direction. And they're the ones who will probably be picked up in my graduate destination surveys, working in shops, not just earning money for a holiday or a postgrad. That's actually the best they could get because they hadn't prepared themselves. So I'm trying to find those people. All career services, I think, are trying to find those people so our expertise can be used to best effect. Well, career registration is not the answer to it, but it is broadly three career-related questions that are now embedded into the student's registration process. So you cannot avoid being presented with these questions. There is an opt-out option in the, in the drop list, but that means that every single student at Birmingham, last September when we introduced it, was asked, do you have any career plan as yet? That was whether they're first years, third year postgrads, um, one-year programs, seconds, third years, all of them, distance learners, all of them. The second question is, do you have any work experience? Drop-down list, they can tick as many as they like. And the third, is there an occupational sector you're already interested in? They answer those questions. If it's a first year, I have a snapshot of a self-perceived. Flawed, I know. If you're social scientists in the room, you can drive a coach and horse through that. But it's the first time that the student voice has been heard en masse, saying, this is what I'm thinking. Goodness knows, that's all we want them to do, is to start thinking. Interestingly enough, the simple act of asking the question triggered engagement. Because for some, some of the students who went, oh, I haven't got a clue, better mosey on over to the career service then. It actually happened. It actually is a, a sort of extrinsic uh, a motivator. But you ask exactly the same question of that same student at the beginning of their second year, then again at the third year. So you're seeing distance travel. Again, flawed. But it's starting to help me identify, say, by the, f the first, at the start of the third year, that I have a student who is consistently saying, I have no idea where I'm going. I've got no work experience. And I can't think of an occupational sector. That starts to tell me maybe this is an individual I really need to reach out to. So it's allowing for targeted interventions by name with very bespoken individualized offers of help. Even things like the occupational stuff allows us to work more closely with employers who previously may not have come onto campus because they didn't think there was demand. And I can turn around and go, oh, no, 1,700 individuals said they were interested in your sector. It's hard to argue against data. So... You can cut and use that data in many ways. Now, there's probably 70 institutions in the UK now doing career registration. It's an absolute game changer. So, fourth industrial revolution, though. So, I've put quite a lot of links at the end of this on a slide. So, if you get the slides, you may or may not want to use them. Things like the World Economic Forum, which is obviously Schwab's area. They're now talking. Uh, many of you know this, but we've got... Uh, McKinsey, Deloitte and PwC have written publications. I mean, many of you will have read The Future of Work, The Future of Jobs. They're all saying the same thing. And it's not a panic stations thing. It's just saying the world is going to change. And it's not saying robots will take all our jobs. It's saying things that are much subtler, which have, that talk to the skill debate, which is if you're, a, if you're an art student, you have got to be computer savvy. You've got to understand the digital environment because my careers advisors now have to cut data and use it to create and craft their interventions, which are about as close to a counselling environment as you can get. They understand it. They understand that understanding data means that they can actually be the professional at their sort of ultimate level. But then you've got the science students who are often tarred with this lack of social skills brush. It's sort of sometimes true. Um, if you walk into a class of third-year physics students at Birmingham, you, you may struggle a bit. Um, but they, in this collaborative, joined-up world that's now being described in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, this thing about teamwork becomes even more uh, marked. But it moves on from teamwork to all of these other phrases, like respecting others, being articulate, and I'm not saying that STEM students are inarticulate, but quite often, if you have to write a report, they're not actually necessarily taught to do that. So you'll get the art students who write 90 pages. You've got the science students who'll give you six bullet points. 
But somewhere in the middle is probably what industry and jobs and us as employers are looking for. And then there's this rather worrying um, thing that I found. 35% of the skills demanded for jobs across industry will change by 2020, but already 25% of employees are saying they don't have the skills needed to do the job they're currently in. So it's live now, and I guarantee that every one of us, I put my hand up to the stats issue, managing my data set. When we collected our career registration data, it produced in six weeks 183,000 data sets, which we now have to do something with. So it's not just collect the data, have a process in place to work with it, and then to measure the impact and then to change it. So the world is changing, and this debate that you're having, you know, if the UK agenda doesn't necessarily chime, this does and should, and I know that all, many of, of you that I've spoken to are very aware of it. Now, I hate skill lists, because I always take umbrage because of the things they don't include, and the fact that every six months it will change. But it's not unhelpful to see these sorts of things. So this is from um, the World Economic Forum uh, documentation. Just type in World Economic Forum Future of Work and you'll get thousands of links to this stuff. But this was written in 2016, and it's already changed. A lot has changed in those two years. So, I mean, I just added skills, so risk management. I mean, when did we start talking about teaching our students risk management? <laughs> you know, it was always inherent in medicine. You know, you had to be very aware of the duty of care. Do no, do, do no harm as a version of risk management. There's risk management in civil engineering. But who knew we'd be teaching historians risk management? <laughs> Um, humility, this is where the humility thing came up, which I thought, well, it's not a skill, it's a quality, maybe. But how do you emphasise that to somebody where you say, balance that natural arrogance that sometimes comes with youth, thinking of my second-year historian, uh, with a recognition that that doesn't always go down very well, particularly with those of us who are old and wise and have been there 20 times. Uh, entrepreneurialism as a term has been around for a long time now but is really coming to the fore leadership has always been there and then valuing others is that teamwork it's probably just a little bit different to it teamwork is working effectively together to a common purpose valuing others is actually having an understanding of other people other cultures other people's experience because you're likely now to work in a global community. You may never even meet the people you work with, but you'll work with them on a daily basis virtually. That's another challenge, is how do you work with people at a distance? You know, this virtual world environment. I mean, you have people who remote work and work from home. Do they get isolated? Is it difficult to engage? Well, that might be the reality for many of our graduates going forward. So what does that mean in terms of skills? I'm saying there that these... These lists are going to change. The only thing that we can do is be aware of them and respond to them. So, again, I'm peeking over my glasses to look at it. Um, the way that we address it is the direction of travel here, is you address it through the whole student experience. It is not something that the career service does. It is not something that the academic does. It's not something an employer does. It's something we all do. And there are many other stakeholders I haven't meant to leave out, like alumni and our guilds or your student societies, they all have a part to play. We all have a part to play. So interestingly enough, maybe the skills issue is something we need to look at ourselves first. It's very nice to be trotting out collaboration skills, working with others and valuing others if we have a closed door policy, if you're an academic to professional services or professional services are snippy about academics. I think we'd better get over ourselves before we start telling students to act in a way that maybe we don't. Is that a bit rude? No. <laughs> well, I heard some laughter, so it clearly was recognised by some of you. So, if you're approaching it, because it's about a process to it, it's, what is it? Because if you're starting this journey, and I think many of you are well down the road, and 14% of you completed it, according to that. Uh, so, well done. Um, but what is it that you're trying to identify? So, I'm, I'm changing the sort of pronoun here. You, us, our, <laughs> we. What is it that actually you want to identify? So when you're setting out on this journey, what does employability or transferable skills mean to you? If you can't figure that out, you're not going to start anywhere or go any further than not answering that question. 
What does it mean to your institution? Because institutions are massively different. There is not one like another. They may look like each other, but they're not. Those of us who work in them, we know what strange institutions we work in. They are the most wonderful places to work. I've worked outside of higher ed and I've worked inside, and higher ed is the place that nourishes my soul. It's a place where it is far more accepting as well as challenging and hidebound and old-fashioned and dynamic and all of those weird things. But they're amazing places. So, but what's your institution's character? Because I don't get the sense that you're being asked to come up with a one-size-fits-all model. And it, it wouldn't work, and it's certainly not, not what we have in the UK. Baby with bathwater, what already exists? You know, duplication is the mother of all evils, as far as I'm concerned. That's where the employers complain. You know, it's just like you're the third person to contact me. You know, do you not know that we're already working in partnership? But also that protectiveness that you get from everybody. Well, I've nurtured this link. This is mine. No, it's not. It's the institutions. And more importantly, it's your students. You can be the gatekeeper. You can be the owner of that, but share. Uh, who's already working in the area, which is part of the auditing thing? And this is the issue of academics, career services, and employers have absolutely got to address this together. Separate any of those three, and it doesn't work as well. I'm sure it can work but not as well as it could and should. And then start small if the task is too big. I do think that a whole institution thing would absolutely freeze me in my, in, my, in my steps. I would need to start somewhere. So if that's something that's maybe difficult, then start with, with a friendly. Get a small group together. Um, again, I, I have a danger of being professional services versus academics, but I come from a career service uh, heritage uh, that is so old, I remember the days when doors would be slammed in my face. Career service got nothing to do with us. Uh, this is English literature, with apologies to English literature. Um, just teaching students English literature is sufficient to uh, ensure their employability. You know, really hard not to snigger at that one. Um, <laughs> it teaches them to be the most wonderful thinkers, to have the most amazing approach to the world, but to make them capable of sitting an interview? Well, no, not really. Um, so I, I think I can say this about sort of shut doors, is that it has to be done. It has to be done in, 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 in partnership. And in those days when doors were shut, they were always the friendlies. There was always the department with the academic who got it. Find one of those, find 10 of them, find 100 of them and work with them. Because I do tend to find, again, I'm being a bit naughty about academics, and there's lots of you in the room, which is quite worrying, is it's a bit like an event where you want academics to come to. There is a very, very um, honourable uh, saying. If you want academics to come, if you feed them, they will come. <laughs> I have never met an academic who will not come for a free lunch. I will always take up an offer of a free lunch, as you can probably tell. Uh, so... Work with those who will work with you if the whole institution approach is too daunting. Because what then will probably happen is the other academics will look at that academic and go, what well, are you getting that I'm not? How are your results getting better than mine? I'll do that as well then. So maybe it is teasing other people in by showing success in an area and then that success being shared from peer to peer. I must be running out of time now. I've talked at you so long. You're ever so patient. <laughs> I know a lot of you are doing your emails and checking things. I do too. <laughs> right. Employab going back to that starting point, if you're struggling with employability, these are UK definitions. They're pretty global, the first two. They've, they've, they've done the rounds, so you're talking about sort of York um, uh, definition. And the second one is the uh, Decrepool and Sewell sort of career edge one. Don't particularly like those now though because they talk about employment and there's a whole debate about employability is not employment it's a different thing employability is the process employment can be an outcome so there is another definition out there i'm not saying that it is the right one i'm just throwing it into the pot because i'm at the point of my talk where i'm just going look try this try that um this one i quite like i would do because jen's this is part of our legacy project, which is a government-funded project that we're doing with six other universities, so I've got sort of a good partnership group there. Um, but it's, it talks about a progressive process. It doesn't talk about a one period in time. That employability is progressive 
and it's lifelong. It should be. Um, we're teaching people to fish. We're not trying to give them a fish. Uh, and this sort of changing world issue, if, if the fourth industrial revolution doesn't say that, I don't know what it says. I, it's giving me my own 15 minute warning there, so I'm five minutes ahead. Uh, if you like frameworks, this is the framework that goes with that last definition, which I think, again, does a rather nice job, if you can see it, of saying employability exists in the whole. It is not an activity that exists over there or at this time. So it takes into account things like individual circumstance, because, you know, if universities aren't the same, then our students certainly aren't the same. Every individual student is utterly different. But if you take it in the round you've got maybe a better chance. Because I think this also appeals to colleagues in universities who have a real and deserved problem with this issue of into employment as the only... I mean, that is a metric. We have to accept that if you are an indebted student, you want a job. You want a job that pays well because you want to pay off that debt. You, know, you don't want that a millstone around your neck forever. So... For somebody of my generation who was paid to go to university, I've had to walk in other students' shoes, realising that what motivated me is different now, very different. But it's still something that is in the round. Again, if you're looking for something to help you get going, it may help, it may not. But um, there is an organisation in the UK that's been known as the Higher Education Academy. They've changed their name to Advance HE. Now, having watched the Commonwealth Games, the Australian national anthem is actually called Advance Australia Affair. Advance Australia Affair. So I can't help thinking this is a little bit of a let's go uh, type thing, which is very un-British, I have to say. <laughs> but this is their new name. And the colleague who leads on this has very kindly allowed his email to be printed on the, the, the notes at the end. So... If you want to have a go at this, you've got the, the, the contacts. Um, it gives you a four-stage approach. Do you know what? There's nothing rocket science about it, but sometimes you just need to go back to basics when you're dealing with something big. So I've already done the four stages earlier in a slide, but there is a document again with a link that you can see the fuller detail. And again, why duplicate? This is out there. And what I was going to say when the microphone went, huh, was... Um, that New Hampshire have already got to uh, uh, these guys because they're doing the same thing. And you're Texans, you can't like that. <laughs> Can you not? Unless some of you are from New Hampshire, in which case you're thinking quietly, yes. <laughs> uh, I think one thing I just wanted to touch on, again, this learning from, the most important thing is this translation, the awareness of what has been done what has been learned, and then translating that into employer language, for, 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 for want of a better word. One of the things that the UK does have, which I don't see here much of, but I haven't asked everybody, too many of you, um, are employability awards, which basically say students learn a huge amount of employability through the extracurricular activities that they do, not just intracurricular. So is there a way of capturing that activity and then encompassing it with the self-awareness? And the answer is yes, they're called employability awards in the UK. So we have one, it's called the Personal Skills Award. Visit our website and you'll find copious pages about it. We currently have 2,000 students a year going through it. It captures 240 odd activities from student societies to jobs on campus. What it doesn't do is say, give us lots of detail about what you're doing. We need that to be quality assured and the provider of that activity quality assures it for us. So we know the student has done 20 hours of whatever. The bit that makes the difference is the required self-reflection session they have to go through to get the award. The bit which you sometimes bring them kicking and screaming to, because self-reflection is the hardest thing. You know, that, that person who internalizes and thinks, I think of Samuel Pepys when I think of a, a, a pure self-reflection where he sits and does his diary for years. Most of us are not like that. Most of us respond to an extrinsic driver, like, I hate my job, I've seen another nicer one elsewhere, better, better stop, not my CV. It's very much what drives students. So you have to give them something uh, to get them to engage in many cases. That's what these awards do, is that they shift the student's understanding and it actually addresses that very issue. I was captain of the school football team. What have I learned, actually, through this? 
Uh, and it works very well. And the thing I'm most proud of is that their graduate destinations, if they do this program, are higher than the institutional average. But it's even more marked with the arts and humanities, the non-vocational. So if there's something in there, it's the fact that those non-vocational students are the ones who need most that extra shot in the arm that, yes, you have learnt this. This is what it looks like, and this is what it looks like on a CV resume. This is what you might say in an interview. So you can run a small version of this. You can run an online version of this. They exist in both forms. We just run a big and online version. And then intracurricular. So I think I've talked about all of this anyway, so I'm going to scootle it. Um, but... You know, you, this is the, the audit of employability skills, which you have to first figure out what does employability mean or transferable skills. What are you actually talking about? Uh, so, said in summary, I think I'm almost perfect timing. It's weird. I do not do this. Those are the questions I would ask myself, and we did ask ourselves in previous years in the UK and continue to ask ourselves, which um, I've already covered. And then I've got, um, for those of you who love elephants, do not be offended by this. But if you are overwhelmed by a large task, there is a cartoon that works rather well, which is, how do you eat an elephant? Bit at a time. So start somewhere. And there's quite a lot of cartoons rather inelegantly showing somebody gnawing on the tail of an elephant. Not nice. So I think what's coming up is a quote which I noticed in the report written by my colleague who runs the Skills Award at Birmingham, um, which you have a link to as well, which I think summarises what we're trying to do wonderfully, and it comes from 100 years ago, 150 years ago. So it's that one, and I will say it, I don't normally read it out. The highest reward for a person's toil is not what they get for it, but what they become by it. And I think if that encom encompasses what we're talking about, it's that. So that's John Ruskin, um, sort of philanthropist and art historian from uh, the Victorian era. And then what you've got is you've got uh, a couple of pages, which, again, I'm assuming you get this. Now, there was going to be a last sort of like silly slide because I was thinking special relationships and thinking I love coming to the States and it's great when you guys come over. I thought, oh, I'll put a Harry and Meghan picture up. And then I thought, oh, no can't so I haven't don't worry but there was a, a reasonably amusing one where it looked as if Harry was teaching Megan to do the wave like that well clearly that's going to obsess the UK next month um, personally I'm delighted um, not because I'm a royalist but I think it's a fundamental change happening to a very old established uh, business so, that is my last slide. It is the Welsh flag. Last time it was the Union Jack. Um, but I'm sticking by my Welsh credentials. And because it's the Texas flag rather than the Stars and Stripes, I thought it was appropriate. So thank you very much for listening so patiently. Now, I'm not sure if you get to be tortured a little bit longer by a microphone wandering around. If you don't have any questions, that's fine. I stand between you and your tea break. But, uh... There's no time I've been told you're blessed. Uh, you are free to go and have a nice cup of tea, which is what I'm going to have, or a coffee. Thank you again, and it's a real pleasure to be back here. Um, I am around for today, well, for, for the conference, um, and love to have a chat. Um, otherwise, my email, please just drop me a line. Right. Enjoy the rest of the day.